Welcome back to the deep dive. Today, we're heading to uh, a really amazing island in the Mediterranean, Cyprus. You probably know it maybe as Aphrodite's mythical birthplace or, you know, for those incredible ancient ruins and sunny beaches. But what if its most, let's say, extraordinary feature isn't something you can see on a map? We're talking about something deeper, something woven right into the genes of its people the Cyprus gene. That's exactly right. What researchers have been finding in Cyprus, it really challenges a lot of our ideas about how people moved around and, well, survived in the past. It seems Cyprus might hold one of the most ancient and maybe least interrupted genetic lines in uh, both Europe and the Middle East. Just imagine that, like a single biological thread stretching all the way from Bronze Age sailors through countless invasions right up to Cypriots today. It's just an incredible story of resilience, you know, a population sticking around when others nearby were completely changed genetically. So for you listening, this deep dive is really about exploring how genetics can be like a living time capsule and how populations sometimes manage to hold on to their identity uh, despite centuries of upheaval. Plus, the surprising and sometimes pretty controversial things this means for identity and health now. Okay, so let's really unpack this fascinating idea. What exactly makes Cyprus this kind of genetic museum? Well, the data itself paints a... Uh, pretty vivid picture. Researchers have found that modern Cypriots carry a really unusually high amount of Bronze Age ancestry. Specifically, it links back to sources in the Aegean, the Levant, and Anatolia. But what's really striking, I think, is how little this gene pool seems to have changed over thousands of years. It's this uh, unique stability, especially when you look at the surrounding regions. They've seen much more dramatic genetic shifts, replacements even. That's pretty incredible. Can you give us some maybe some specific numbers or data mm -hmm. that really drives this point home? Absolutely. So there was a big genomic study back in 2021. It was published in Nature. And it found that something like 78 to 82 percent, a huge chunk of Cypriot ancestry today, traces directly back to those ancient Asian farmers and Levantine seafarers. Just think about that. It means their genetic makeup is, in many ways, older and more consistent than what you'd find in a lot of mainland Greek or Turkish populations today. And we also see this continuity in Cyprus's unique Y-DNA haplogroups. Those are the markers passed down just through the male line, right? Mm. Tracing paternal ancestry, uh, specifically groups like J2A and EM78. They show really deep continuity and very little um, genetic drift. Genetic drift is just those random changes over generations. So limited drift suggests centuries of being sort of isolated, genetically speaking, even with all all those invasions. Oh, and here's another really key point. Cyprus has one of the lowest percentages of what we call steppe ancestry. You know, that's the genetic signature from ancient nomadic groups from the Eurasian steppe who spread all across Europe, often replacing local genes. Well, in Cyprus, it's less than 5%. Compare that to its neighbors. It means the island population largely resisted that massive genetic replacement event that really reshaped Europe back in the Bronze Age. Wow. It really does paint a picture of history written directly into DNA, doesn't it? Just this remarkable biological continuity that, like you said, a few places can claim. And what makes it even more astonishing, thinking about that deep genetic foundation, is how it managed to last through centuries of invasions that completely changed the surrounding regions. I mean, Cyprus has such a turbulent history. It feels like almost everyone conquered it at some point. Assyrians, Egyptians, Greeks, Romans, Byzantines, Arabs, Crusaders, Ottomans, the British. So despite all of that, how on earth did its gene pool stay so, well, stable? How did this living museum survive all that when others were genetically reshaped? Yeah, it's a great question. Scientists suggest there's a fascinating dynamic going on. While, yes, the language changed, the religion changed, the way the island was governed changed dramatically under all those empires. It seems the rural and island populations often managed to preserve their genetic identity. How? Yeah. Well, likely through just consistent intergenerational continuity, you know, marrying locally, continuing to farm the same lands generation after generation, and uh, essentially resisting widespread genetic assimilation from the outside. It's really a testament to the resilience of those local communities. It shows that political conquest doesn't always mean genetic replacement. That makes a lot of sense, actually, when you think about how local life was for most people historically, just staying put. But bringing these kinds of genetic findings into a place like Cyprus, well, it inevitably stirs up some complexities and uh, let's just say some pretty heated debates. Oh, absolutely. And this is where it gets incredibly sensitive because genetic studies have shown that both Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots, you know, despite the deep political divisions, actually share over 96 percent of their ancestry. 
That finding, as you can imagine, throws a really complex wrench into longstanding political narratives. Right. And you can see how that plays out. You have some nationalist groups, maybe on both sides, who just outright reject these findings. They argue that, you know, political identity or modern nationality is what matters, not some shared genetic past. Yeah. But then you also have others saying, hold on, maybe it's time we reframe the whole Cyprus story around this shared heritage instead of just focusing on the division. And this really brings up a fundamental question, one that goes way beyond Cyprus. Should we even be using genetics to define national identity in the first place? When you take scientific findings like this and drop them into such a politically charged situation, well, the Cyprus gene suddenly becomes more than just biology. It becomes a uh, potentially political dynamite. That's a really powerful point. It highlights the challenge, doesn't it? You know, for me, what's striking is how science, which is supposed to be objective, can get so tangled up in these very subjective human issues of identity and conflict. It really forces you to ask, are these biological connections ultimately more unifying or divisive when the history is already so painful? Let's maybe shift gears slightly, though, move away from the history and politics for a moment. Let's talk about how this unique genetic profile offers um, modern health insights, because it's not just about the past, right? It's also about what these genes mean for people living on the island today. Not at all, you're right. This genetic distinctiveness actually provides some powerful insights for modern medicine. Recent medical studies are finding certain, let's call them genetic quirks, among Cypriots that might give us incredible clues about patterns in neurological diseases, maybe even cancer resistance. For instance, there is a rare mutation in the BRCA1 gene, which is linked to breast cancer. It's found at elevated levels in Cypriot women. And this discovery has actually led to a very targeted screening program right there in Cyprus. It's possible that the lessons learned there could one day help improve breast cancer detection globally. And then there's thalassemia. It's a serious blood disorder, and it has a higher than average incidence in Cyprus. But this challenge didn't just create a problem. It actually forced Cyprus to take early widespread action. It made them pioneers in population level genetic screening. Their approach, which they started developing way back in the 1970s out of necessity, actually became a global model. It really showed how understanding a community's specific genetic predispositions can lead to truly transformative public health results. They've nearly eliminated new cases of the severe form of the disease in newborns. So yeah, Cyprus isn't just preserving ancient DNA like a museum piece. They're actively using that knowledge, that unique genetic heritage to lead the way in some areas of modern genetic medicine. It shows how ancient roots can genuinely inform modern solutions. And speaking of those ancient connections, those seafarers who left their genetic mark, there's another really fascinating layer here, isn't there? One that takes us even deeper into the island's past, linking it to one of the most, well, enigmatic seafaring cultures of antiquity, the Phoenicians. Can you tell us a bit about this legendary link? Indeed. Historians often emphasize that Cyprus might have been a key outpost for the Phoenicians. You know, those ancient traders and sailors based in the Levant who spread their language, their trade goods, and it seems their genes all across the Mediterranean. And there's actually a specific genetic marker found in modern Lebanese men, the heartland of ancient Phoenicia, and also in Cypriot men. It's the J2B M205Y haplogroup. This strongly supports the idea of a shared paternal lineage stretching back maybe 3,000 years or more. But again, you see how this immediately circles back to those identity debates you were just talking about. Does this mean modern Cypriots are Greeks or Turks or maybe even Phoenicians or are they just Cypriots? Can genetics really give us a definitive answer to that or does it just add you know, more noise to an already complicated sense of identity? What do you think stands out there reflecting on this layered history? That's such a powerful question. And it really underlines how messy identity gets when science enters the picture. For me, I think what stands out is just the sheer persistence of these genetic connections. Whether you call it Greek or Turkish or Phoenician ancestry, the DNA tells the story of deep, enduring links across huge spans of time and geography. It sort of suggests that maybe identity isn't about fitting neatly into one box. Maybe it's more about acknowledging this incredible interwoven tapestry of human history that exists within people, within populations. It adds this layer of shared heritage that can either be, well, ignored or maybe, hopefully, embraced somehow. Wow, what an incredible deep dive this has been. It really drives home how a seemingly small island like Cyprus can tell such a huge story, a story that spans millennia, crosses borders, and really touches on the fundamental question of who we are. It really is. It's a tale of ancient survival, isn't it? Of shared blood running deeper than modern divisions. And uh, that ongoing tension between what science reveals and how societies decide to define themselves. So thinking about all this, what does it mean for you listening right now? Do you think genetic history should be used to try and unify people, to highlight those shared roots we talked about? 
Or is it just too risky, too easy to stir up more division when you bring biology into these complex historical and political situations? Should modern nations maybe rethink how they define identity based on biology? Or should identity remain purely cultural, purely political? It's definitely a lot to think about. And clearly, the conversation around the Cypress gene and what it means is far from over.